Parks, but good morning. Welcome to the final event of the 2020 Georgia Legislative Policy Forum. I'm Kyle Wingfield. I'm the president and CEO of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, and we thank you for joining us today. It is hard to believe, but this is the finale for our eight session, seven week webinar series. We staged the 10th edition of this forum in this way, rather than as our usual in-person all day conference due to the pandemic. Uh, we knew we had to adapt just as Georgians have adapted in so many ways to this year's sharply changed circumstances. And fittingly, the theme for this year's event, a play on the state motto, has been wisdom, justice, adaptation. If you missed the earlier events, including our opening keynote with U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos and panel discussions about education, the budget, land use and transportation, the economy, housing, and healthcare, you can find our recordings on our YouTube channel, Georgia Policy. We're pleased that some 700 people have watched at least one of the sessions already, and a recording of today's event will also be available on that channel soon. Uh, now, we are also grateful uh, for the support of some uh, key sponsors during this series. You would think I would get it by now. Here we go. Uh, and those sponsors are our presenting sponsor, AT&T, our platinum sponsors, Verizon and the Walton Family Foundation, and our silver sponsor, the Georgia Association of Realtors. Uh, we thank each of them for their support of this event, which has allowed us to offer an outstanding lineup of speakers at no cost to our audience. Uh, we would, However, uh, appreciate your voluntary support of our work, and you can visit georgiapolicy.org slash donate to make a tax-deductible contribution. And during this morning's program, we would like to hear questions from you in the audience. You can submit those to us in the chat or Q&A boxes on your screen. Just type your questions there, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can in the time we have. I do want to point out uh, for today's event that the Chief Justice I can't comment on specific cases that could come before the Supreme Court in the future, so please keep that in mind as you formulate your questions for him. Uh, and with that, let's get started with our conversation with Chief Justice Harold Melton of the Georgia Supreme Court. Uh, Chief Justice Melton was appointed to the court in 2005, and next year, next week will mark two years uh, since he became Chief Justice. Uh, you can get his full bio uh, on the program, which is available on our website, georgiapolicy.org. But let me just say we're delighted to have him with us this morning, and uh, welcome. Thank you, Kyle. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm intimidated by the level of serious conversations you've had, I hope to be able to add to it. <laughs> well, I'm confident of that. I'm not worried about that at all. Um, so, so let's get started. Uh, you know, for many of us, this pandemic came as a real surprise. Um, and while the particular timing of it may have also surprised you, this is something you've actually been preparing for uh, for more than a decade. So tell us about that. Yeah, so when I came on to the court in 2005, Justice uh, Leah Sears was Chief Justice. And she was approached by a lawyer with the Atlanta Bar Association. And he was concerned about reports that he had been reading and, and really took very seriously about the imminency of a pandemic. And so he urged her to, to take that, that threat seriously and to begin planning for a pandemic. And so she called me into her office. This was probably 2007 or so. I was new to the court. And she asked me to, to lead a committee on preparing for a pandemic. And you can imagine at that time how remote preparing for a pandemic sounded. It, it struck me as being asked to lead a committee on preparing for a falling sky. But um, I agreed to do it and we formed a, a committee together. We met with public health officials and I was convinced at the end of that process that it really was a matter of uh, when, not if, and that it could be very serious. And so we began preparations for how to continue core operations in the midst of a pandemic. And a lot of the scenarios that were 
that we're seeing now were anticipated and discussed then. So we had a survey of all the applicable statutes for quarantines, for um, judicial emergency declarations. We had a survey of all the applicable rules. And one of the real important things that, that came out of that that I now value greatly is, is that we identified a, a hole in our Judicial Emergency Act. The Judicial Emergency Act gives me as Chief Justice the authority to declare a judicial emergency and to suspend statutory deadlines, the timing of filings and things along those lines. But the act as it existed at that time only allowed for a total of 90 days for a judicial emergency. And so in the course of, of our, our conversations, we identified that as, a, as something that needed to be fixed we went to the legislature, got that extended, so that now the act reads that as long as the governor has a declared public health emergency, I as chief justice can continue to, de to declare a judicial emergency for that same length, length of time. We're now going into our sixth month of a judicial emergency, and if we had not caught that, we would have been in dire straits. I don't know what we would have done. Well, and, and um, you know, even with that preparation, obviously, the judicial branch has had to adapt uh, to these circumstances, and, and, and you can only prepare so much. You've got you've to make some changes. So what are some of the things that the courts have not been able to do as usual over the past five or six months, and what kind of changes can we expect going forward? Well, you know, you, that's a broad question. That's been a moving target, and you're right. There's, you know, we, we, we identify the things that we knew to anticipate, and when you go into this, you find all kinds of real life implications that you had no way of knowing and you have to adapt. We, we've had to suspend the, the bar exams. So lawyers are, aren't taking the bar exam in July like they otherwise would. They're gonna be taking a virtual online bar exam in October. Uh, we, we've had to change rules to enhance the use of video conferencing technology. Uh, but to answer your question more directly, when, when this pandemic hit in March, early March is when our courts really started feeling the impact, we issued our first judicial emergency order. And at that point, it was safety first, safety first, and still is safety first. But we trimmed down to the bare bones of core operations. That's when you started hearing conversations about critical functions, essential functions, and anything that was not a core or essential function, we asked the courts to put on hold. The courts agreed to do that, or they complied. We basically put it in the order, and the courts did that. Since that time, we've been migrating away from just doing core functions, just doing essential functions, adding back the other functions that are, are, that are, are critical to what the judiciary provides to the communities. And we've learned how to do those in a safe manner. We've learned how to take advantage of video technology. Uh, so th that's been our migration since March, constantly adding back in a safe manner. There are two functions that are very, very, very important that we have not been able to add back that we're going to have to add back real soon. Those are grand jury proceedings and jury trials. Um, we mentioned our, our preparation going into this, you know, the healthcare experts would have said, if you have a pandemic, the average shelf life of a pandemic is about a 90 day window. You need to prepare to get, you know, to how to survive and how to operate for that 90 day time horizon. This has exceeded that. And I think on the front end of going into this pandemic, our hope and expectation was we hold off on these functions wait for the pandemic to run its course, and then we get back going again. We are in a different landscape now. We're not trying to wait out the pandemic. We are now trying to figure out how to actually conduct jury proceedings and grand jury proceedings in the midst of a pandemic, which is a totally different set of questions that, than we were asking before. Absolutely, and so you know, along those lines, obviously, as, as you mentioned, you, you've had to issue uh, emergency orders regarding the courts, uh, but you're not alone you know, you know, in our state or local governments in having to do so. So let's broaden this out a bit and tell us what the, how the federal and state constitutions put parameters around what leaders at all levels of government in Georgia 
are able to do through these sorts of emergency actions. So we, we've, uh, I'm proud of how our, our court has handled it. We have an internal court team on the Supreme Court. Uh, we're meeting with each other and we'll meet again tomorrow to talk about our next judicial order. We have 30 day windows on that, those orders. We have conversations with our judicial governing apparatus, which is the judicial council. But we've been very disciplined in how we how we approach what we put in our orders and what we allow or don't allow. So first of all, we have our Judicial Declaration Emergency Act, and that cabins what we can and can't do, it, which is good because it imposes discipline. It, it, it keeps me from saying, this is a good idea. Let me put this in the order and make this happen, or let's to stop these types of proceedings because I just think it's a good idea. So everything we're doing is something that is authorized by the Judicial Emergency Act and is consistent with the Constitution. So for example, when we talk about um, video conferencing for court hearings, we know constitutionally that we have a public right to access court proceedings. Well, those rights belong to the defendant. The defendant can waive public access but those rights also belong to the public. The defendant cannot waive the public's right to public access. So everything we do in terms of video conferencing for court proceedings has to be available to the public in some form or fashion. Now that doesn't mean that it has to be made available and blasted on YouTube or something along those lines. What we try to do is mimic what happens in real life. And in real life, it just has to be available to those who take the time to get out of their house, get in their car, drive to the courthouse, go through security screening, and sit in a room and wait for it to happen. And so we don't need to put up barriers, but there are, um, we do have to make sure that we make it reasonably available. Uh, a lot of the problems that we have in, in dealing with the jury trial question goes to how do we make sure that if we utilize video technology for any aspect of a jury trial, we ensure that we have a, a fair cross section of representation from the community. So what do you do about people who don't have uh, access to a computer device or a cell phone in their home or have enough minutes on their phone to sit through jury selection and what do you do about people who live in parts of the state where there isn't adequate Wi-Fi or 5G, 4G, whatever the technology may be necessary to, to participate? So we absolutely have to comply with all the constitutional requirements. We just have to do so in a new way. And one of the challenges is that we're so used to seeing things done a certain way that we assume that's how they must be done. So we have to parse out what are the things that we're used to seeing that must be done because the Constitution requires it, and what are the things that are just, just things that we're used to seeing that don't necessarily have to be done that way. And, and so those are the kind of things we're wrestling with. Absolutely. And uh, let me just remind everybody watching that the Q&A boxes and chat boxes are where you can submit your questions uh, for Chief Justice Melton, and we will uh, hope to have plenty of time to, to get through those. Um, so, you know, in, in addition to parameters, um, and, and you were kind of uh, getting toward this, I think, but, you know, the, these constitutions also give elected officials and other governmental leaders a framework for solving even unforeseen problems like a pandemic, for, for balancing interests and rights and those sorts of things. So, you know, from your perspective at the, in the judicial branch, how, how, do they, how do they accomplish that? The balancing. Um, there's a lot of flexibility. There's a ton of flexibility in what is required. So for example, with grand jury proceedings, uh, we have targets that we have to shoot for. We have to shoot for openness. We have to shoot for uh, the ability to confront your accusers. Uh, but there's no set way on how that has to be done. Uh, and, and then the other thing is with all our rights, with all the rights that we have, every individual has the ability to waive their rights and their constitutional rights. So one of the things we're making available is all the tools uh, and we're urging attorneys to ask their clients questions like, do you want to waive the right to, uh, to, to be present for this particular uh, proceeding? 
Uh, we do need to make sure that documents that are, that are evidence are available in a real time manner in a meaningful way to, to, the, to the parties, to the juries, to the fact finders. One of the other things we have to make sure is that the attorneys representing criminal defendants in particular have, have the opportunity to have meaningful conversations with their clients in the midst of a, a virtual hearing. Uh, sometimes they have to be present. Sometimes they have to have a, another side avenue to be able to have those meaningful conversations with their clients in the midst of these proceedings. Are you finding many uh, many people taking advantage of those those waivers so far, or how is that going? For certain proceedings, yes. Uh, for your initial presentment for before a judge, absolutely. We've been able to cut down on what you probably grown used to seeing, which is jail transports to the courts. You see the buses going to the courthouse for ma mass calendar calls. A lot of those calendar calls aren't happening anymore. They're, they're showing up, they're lining up in certain facilities at the jail, and we're conducting those initial presentations that way. A lot of the, uh, the a lot of um, warrant hearings and, and things along those lines are all being done by video, and I think we'll continue to be done that way. We we actually learned that there's some efficiencies that can be gained by by using those those tools. And and we we've talked a lot about the criminal side, but how about how about the civil side? Is, does is it how is it affected maybe differently uh, by well, some of these changes? Well, it's taking a hard hit. Um, we have a huge backlog that has built up at this time. You can imagine six months of not having grand jury proceedings and six months of not having jury trials. It's been a huge backlog. There have been some civil cases that have been able to be moved uh, because the civil usually takes the back seat to the criminal. But when, that, when the floodgates open up, uh, you have the criminal defendants that have speedy trial demands. There are people even who haven't filed speedy trial demands who are still in jail and obviously their, their questions, their issues need to be resolved just as a, as a matter of good, decent government. And so the civil in, in all likelihood will take a back seat to the criminal. And that could be devastating. That could be really devastating. So our judges, I'm proud of our judges. Our judges have proved to be very mission oriented. This is not a job, this is a mission, it's a calling. And they see their role in the community as very critical and they're eager to get back to it. They're prepared to work long, hard hours to work that backlog down. The staff of the courthouses are prepared to work long and hard to get the backlogs down. Also, you have to keep in mind that the courts run on budgets, county budgets, state budgets, and those budgets have been hit hard. So in all reality, we're all going to have to do all those things more at, at a greater level with, with fewer resources. We're prepared to do that as well, uh, but there, there will, there'll be a backlog and there'll be, there'll be some implications across the board uh, on the folks who are really struggling to get their answers, much needed answers resolved in a timely manner. And, and I know we're still relatively early in, in this, uh, in this experience, uh, as you mentioned, even, even in our sixth month of it. Um, but, and, and, and I guess what I mean by that is we're relatively early in trying out some of these adaptations that, that we've had to resort to in the judicial branch and all sorts of walks of life. W from within the judicial branch, are there some of these changes that you could uh, foresee uh, having a, a lasting effect on, on how the courts operate? And, and maybe, you know, they do introduce some efficiencies and, and that, uh, you know, budgets may not come back for some time, that, that sort of thing. It, could we see, is this maybe the future of how the courts will work in some ways? Yeah, I think that, uh, certainly with the, the reliance on, on video technology, we will definitely see more utilization of video technology. I don't think we'll do the, the jail transports nearly as much. Bond hearings and things along those lines can be done without bringing people to the jail, I mean, excuse me, to the courthouses. Um, our court has not missed a step. We went to virtual or arguments really early on. It's easy, easy for us to do because we're not examining witnesses. We're all looking at paper and we just need to have two lawyers in front of us arguing a case and we're ready to go. 
we've been we've been able to do that without any compromise in our functions. So we will utilize that tool to some degree going forward. I think we'll still prefer in person over over virtual, but also just from a staffing standpoint, we're not in a rush to bring our people back into the building. Uh, I do think courthouses across the state will be figuring out what people they need actually physically present and the ability to accommodate those who need to telework will, will be a lot higher. Uh, in the short term, we will definitely need to continue these tools as people struggle with, you know, kids who are in school, having to do their, their learning at home and having to accommodate parents. Uh, so in the short term, we're, we're not eager to move away from these tools that we're utilizing right now. And how about for uh, people who are training to, be, to become lawyers and, and uh, you know, going through, going through law school, uh, trying to pass the bar, that sort of thing? What, what sort, how, is that, how have they been affected throughout all this? Well, yeah, you know, the, the people who are in, in law school are, have the advantage. They have been doing legal research uh, via computer. Probably that's all they've ever known. They're used to reading documents on the computer screen. I'm still the mindset where I need to hit print and get a pen out and write as I'm, I'm doing my reading. So they're, they're ready to, to adapt to this, this virtual operation. Our court, we, had, we got a new justice on our court in February and she still has not moved into her office. 100% of her court operations and for her and her staff have been by computer. And the young folks are able to do that. The biggest impact on law students is the inability to have an in-person bar exam and that that's huge so our bar examiners the board of bar examiners has done a great job of making the adjustments necessary the first thing we did was provide a way for there to be a provisional license to practice law uh, as long as they were under a mentor as long as they um, graduated from an accredited law school in georgia they could qualify for a provisional license for a li limited period of time. So that was the first thing they did. And then the second thing is the big pivot on the bar exam itself, moving to an online exam that's reduced uh, and uh, to, that can be proctored by, by, by access of a video camera on the, on the computer itself. Uh, those are the kind of things that uh, they've done to make sure that you that the attorneys young these graduates could have access to a bar exam and get a get get a license to practice law in the state. Very good. Well, um, again, uh, those in the audience continue to send your questions and uh, including along those that topic uh, or those that set of topics. We're going to shift gears a little bit here. Um, you know, the pandemic has obviously been one of 2020's major stories, uh, but another has been the deaths of several African-Americans, mostly, but not only African-American men at the hands of police. And we've had the subsequent protests and debates uh, that the, those deaths have sparked about policing and racial justice. So um, could you share just your, your thoughts about what the country has been going through this summer? Well, you know, this is a big topic and there's so many different ways to even start trying to peel that back. So I think at bottom, it is a call from the African American community and I'm pleased to say that that call is expanded beyond the African American community to the community at large, but it is a call for an insistence on the rule of law. Um, you know, if you look at our history and if you ask uh, any black American to, to talk about their experiences and their parents' experiences and their grandparents' experiences with law enforcement, you know, law has not always been on the side of uh, African Americans. In fact, uh, it, it, was, it, it worked against us intentionally. Uh, and then as we moved more towards a rule of law ap applicable to all, there was this, there's always this piece that, that, that was, that stuck in our crawl. What about the, what about the law enforcement? You know, there were always stories about law enforcement behaving badly. 
but it was so hard for for the general population to believe that the law enforcement that we know and love could conceivably behave badly. And then there was the Rodney King and you saw the video and, and I think within the black community, the reaction was, okay, now it's, it's on video. We see it clearly that this can no longer be a debate. Clearly now the rule of law will, will see to making sure this doesn't happen again, that these police officers will be punished. And since that time, well, those officers were initially acquitted and then the federal government had to come in and bring charges. But since that time, it's been happening over and over again. Sometimes they were justified. Sometimes they were not justified. Sometimes it was close. But the overall perception was that there was not this insistence on holding law enforcement when they do behave badly to the rule of law. And if there was a, a move towards taking action, it was reluctant and it was the bare minimum. And so there's this pent up frustration that's now exploding. That scares me from this standpoint, um, but it's also healthy. Uh, it's healthy in that it, it, it's another area where we as a society need to make sure that the rule of law is applicable. And the desire is not just to have the rule of law applicable, the desire is not, not to have individuals shot unnecessarily. But where that does happen, you want the rule of law to, to apply. That's the healthy part. Uh, what scares me is because of the frustration that's out there, I, I don't know how discerning we will be as a community or as a society uh, to be selective about when we express great outrage uh, and, and where we say, well, that was unfortunate, but that was within the bounds of the law. And uh, my concern is that we just won't be as discriminating as we need to be because police officers do have the need from time to time to use deadly force. Uh, and we don't need to overcorrect and, and in most things in society, in life, we, we tend to overcorrect. And if we overcorrect too far in this area, it can be very, very dangerous. Throughout these protests, we've heard a lot about systemic problems and needed changes to systems, such as the criminal justice system. So uh, what do you think about that? Do you share those concerns? <laughs> I always challenge people to tell me what in the world you're talking about when they talk about systemic change, what is the system that, you, that you're identifying and what is the change that you want to see? And so if you tell me that the change, the system that you're identifying is the criminal justice system, then my next question is define to me what you mean by the criminal justice system and then tell me what, which parts of that system do you think need to be changed? I do find that when you're able to define what that system is and, and you can identify what pieces need to be changed, meaningful, very meaningful results can be found. Uh, we've seen the criminal justice reform that has happened in Georgia over the last several years. That's a result of really putting fingers on aspects of the system that can be modified uh, effectively. And that, that's been great. When I ask the question, what do you mean by the criminal justice system, ultimately, what you, what, you, what you generally end up with is identifying something that begins with somebody picking up the phone to dial 911 as the front end of the criminal justice system. And the back end is when they walk out of a transition facility or, com or complete parole. Um, so that supervision on the tail end of a sentence it ends the criminal justice system. We tend to look at disparities in numbers of people involved in the criminal justice system as an indication that the criminal justice system itself is in need of even more reform. The challenge that I have with that is those disparities that exist in the criminal justice system don't just exist in the criminal justice system. If you look at the numbers in high school dropout rates, in teenage pregnancy rates, in domestic violence, in defects calls, in infant mortality rates. If you look at COVID, 
you, you see similar numbers across the board. And so the fact that we see those numbers in our criminal justice system doesn't mean our criminal justice system is out of whack if they're consistent with all the other demographics that we see. What it points to, to me, is a breakdown in communities, a brokenness in communities, a desperate need for healing in communities. And yes, that brokenness absolutely is a result of a lot of bad stuff that has happened, a lot of that attributed to racism. Uh, but, and, and that's the healing that needs to happen. So for example, we know of the disparities of African Americans in their criminal justice system. We also know that in, this, in the midst of COVID, many more children are going to have to learn at home. If we know what I just talked about, that we have systematic problems within our communities or brokenness within our communities, those who are living in that brokenness don't really have a good shot of effectively getting the support they need to learn at home. So that educational gap will broaden. And so if we're concerned about our criminal justice system, we need to get involved on the front end to make sure that gap doesn't get too broad even broader and see if we could narrow that gap because this is a real desperate time for those children who are at home and don't have the support that they need uh, for whatever reason uh, to get the education that they need. And if that, that's not effectively dealt with, that gap's gonna get worse and we're gonna see the impact of that in our criminal justice system down the road and in the other statistics that I just mentioned. Absolutely. No, it, it is one of the reasons that, uh, that we have to take such a broad look at what's going on right now in our society and, and what's gone on for, for years and decades in our society to see, you know, what, what, is, what is the root source of, of some of these issues. So um, let's, let's get to some of the questions that we have from the audience. Um, one is, is along these lines. Um, uh, the question is, do you feel the weight as a black man, as a black chief justice of this social justice movement that is sweeping the nation and maybe a little bit more along the lines of, it's different from what you talked about. In what ways has your life experience shaped you as chief justice uh, in, in ways that perhaps are different from those who have preceded you? Do I feel the, the, the criminal justice conversation is a conversation that I've had for years, long before uh, what we're seeing in our society today. And my, my information is not formed by listening to speakers, not listen to the, the general conversation. In my view, I get frustrated by the general conversation because the general conversation does not move the needle. It does not address the real needs. Uh, in my free time as a young adult, I volunteered with teen ministry and I was involved in, in the inner city um, housing projects. I was in and out of those homes. I was chasing teenagers. I, that's what I do for fun. I love working with teenagers. And the teenagers I dealt with were the ones in the downtown area. And so I was in and out of the homes. I saw the lifestyles. I saw the dynamics. I saw the, the thought patterns, the, the values, the principles that people were living by. Also, I read cases. I read cases all day, every day about what people are doing before they commit their crimes. And one of the things that people don't talk about is the reason why we have so many people in prison is because we have a lot of crimes being committed. Why do we have so much criminal activity? And that is born out of something. It is born out of a, 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 out of a different way of living that's not healthy and it's not productive. And even the people who aren't committing crimes, if you read what's going on before the crimes happen, it's not healthy living either. And so that is, that is the, the, the bottom line of what I see having been in the neighborhoods, having walked with kids on a very intimate basis and having read, the, read these files for years, we have just a lot of people are struggling to live life in a healthy way. That is the core issue. And we've got to come along pe alongside folks and help them, help them live life in a healthy way not in a judgmental way. Uh, I've had conversations even this year with a, a, a lady who called me and said, 
you know, uh, my boss messed up my check and I need to know what my rights are. Well, well, what happened? Well, he messed up my check and, you know, he told me to leave. I said, why did he tell you to leave? Well, I, 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 he didn't like the way I was talking to him. How did you talk to him? Well, I cussed him out. Well, you can't cuss out your boss. So we have to, you really, we literally have to have this conversation when you, when you have an issue at work, you, you have to work through it in a, in a healthy way. Yes, you, they were wrong to mess up your check. Yes, they need to fix it. No, you can't curse them out. And these are the kind of conversations we need to have. If we don't have these conversations, not just conversations, if we don't walk with people long-term, uh, you could put a, a, a facility in the backyard of a, of a depressed neighborhood and people won't be willing and able to take full advantage of the job opportunities created there. You could give people all the money they need, but without a change in how we view life and the ability to live life effectively, we won't effectively deal with these issues. So I'm, I'm convinced that we have, to, we have to talk out loud about the level of brokenness that's out there and talk out loud about what it takes to create healing and life skills and support and give support. And that's, that's what's worked in our criminal justice reform. That's what alternative courts do. They deal with the core underlying issues and say, how can we come around your life and, and do this in a, a, a better way? And it, that's better for the individuals, better for the, the spouse, the boyfriend, girlfriend, the children, it's better for everybody involved. And when you solve that one problem, which is how you live life, you solve your criminal justice issues, you solve your infant mortality issues, your domestic violence issues, your alcohol abuse, you solve all those things. But it is in fact very labor intensive. Right, right. Well, and, and another question that we've gotten in here is um, related to, um, the protests that we've seen and, and uh, the criminal justice system moves slowly and, and a lot of, and deliberately, I guess is maybe the, the better way to put it. Um, and, and in the meantime, there's a lot of frustration and, and the person asking the question refers to looting and burning down businesses. So wh how, how, do we, uh, how do we move from that frustration to what you're talking about? Yeah, and some, some of this is educational, some of it is, you know, an emotional response. I don't, I don't know how you, how you deal with the emotional response that has, has built up without the emotions being poured out in some form or fashion. Obviously, we don't want the emotions poured out in a way that causes damage to other people's property. I don't want the solution to, to perceived injustice or real injustice to be injustice to somebody else. I think it's upon us as government officials, not just in Georgia, but elsewhere, to not just give assurances that the wills of justice will in fact move in a timely fashion, but to actually do it. We have to rebuild credibility with, with our communities. That, that trust has been broken. That trust, it should not be a surprise that that trust is broken because it has it's been something that's been talked about and called for for a long time, but we have to build that trust. It's important that when we see bad actors of any walk of life, we don't wait to, to be urged to, to, re, to do the right thing, and we have to do it in a timely manner. And that timely means not too fast, but also not too slow. Uh, there, there's a sweet spot there. We don't need to rush to judgment. The, the beauty of our justice system that it is, is that it is a thoughtful process. Uh, but we, we definitely are in a trust building mode right now. Uh, another question that we've gotten here uh, refers to uh, something that you mentioned, but maybe you could, you could go into a little bit deeper detail. And that's been, uh, what has been the impact of Georgia's accountability courts over the past decade? What, what, have, seen, what have been some results that you've seen from that? Well, it's been tremendous. It's, it's been tremendous. And I think that it's, it's still a, a uh, it's still secret that the criminal justice reforms have been as effective. I will tell you, I've gone to speak at a couple of these graduations. And if you ask me, in my mind, I 
I was wonderful. I gave, I gave a great 20 minute presentation. I had the, the audience at the tip of my fingers. I could, I had them moving through all kinds of emotions. And then I sat down and then they let the, the graduates speak. And, I, and you just can't compete with those graduates. Those graduates talk about their lives, their journeys, and they look at the judge at the end of that. This is a judge in a criminal case. And, they, and when tears in their eyes, they say, judge, you saved my life. And they look to their families and they, and they, 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 they restored to their families to play the role that they're supposed to play as a mother, as a father, as an uncle, as a big brother. And that has economic impact. It has real life impact. It's tremendous. Within the black community, we've had 25% decrease in the incarceration rate of African Americans within the last eight years. That's huge. There has been no single greater factor or advancement in criminal justice reform that deals with the issues that we've said we're concerned about in a way that even comes close to that. So uh, it's cost effective. It's cheaper than putting a person in a hard prison bed. And the reality is many times when you go into a hard prison facility, if it's for something that's not for life, you're coming back out within five, 10, 15 years. And under the old way of doing business, we weren't sending people back to society any better as a result of the experience. They're coming back harder, uh, maybe angrier. And this is just a smarter approach. Now there's still people that we absolutely need to put in a hard prison facility. There are people who are dangerous and we don't need to, the, the, to have that. But even this process, as I said before, is, is very labor intensive because it means there's a level of intimacy that has to be, be won and gained uh, in order to interact with somebody's individual personalized issues, life issues in a meaningful way. Uh, but we've, we found that when, when we're able to do that, it, it has real results. It's reduced our recidivism rate by I think a third uh, where it's been done. And, we're, and by, by the way, we're, what we're talking about when we talk about accountability courts, we're talking about courts that de deal with DUI issues, alcoholism, drug courts, mental health courts, which is huge. Unfortunately, the largest provider of mental health services in the state of Georgia is our prison system. So we've got to find a way to deal with mental health issues earlier, more effectively than utilizing our criminal justice system. Uh, or a prison system. So mental health courts, veterans courts, uh, huge issue. Uh, and it, it, can we do something better by way of our veterans who have issues that, that can be dealt with rather than sending them to prison? So these are the kinds of, of accountability courts that are out there and they've been a, a big success statewide. Absolutely, and, and, and mental health does seem like a, a natural sort of next area uh, for criminal justice reform to take. I know that, that criminal justice reform broadly has been something that we at the foundation have worked on for years. And, and that's something that, that we've identified that there are public health benefits that accrue from that. There are criminal justice uh, system benefits that accrue from that education. I mean, there's just, it, it cuts across so many areas of, of our community. Right. And, you know, Governor Deal was big on the, on the uh, accountability courts. Governor Kemp has uh, out of the gate initiated a mental health commission that looks at mental health broadly, including the criminal justice side of things. So uh, that that's, obviously and clearly one of the next areas that should be tackled. And then one more question along these lines, have you seen results uh, yet from the community oriented reforms in the juvenile justice system? Uh, I haven't seen the statistics as much, but that's where we need to be. Um, we, we need to be there. Uh, we need to be on the front end of issues dealing with kids even before they get to the juvenile justice system. Let me give you an example. Uh, we know that our schools, for example, are the primary provider for food for breakfast and lunch, and sometimes dinner. 
that is a identifiable population of kids who are at risk. A kid that has to go to school for breakfast, lunch, and dinner has more problems than where they get food. And if we don't deal with those kinds of issues on the front end, we're gonna have problems. What I've been saying as of late is that the problems that we have in schools, in terms of education, our education problem is not a school problem. Uh, we can deal with all the aspects that we can deal with as far as improving schools, but we need to follow Johnny home and see what's going on there. Is, is there a place where Johnny can study? Is there a place where you know, uh, the room is quiet, there's not music being played, there are people coming in and out, it's not smoke filled? Uh, or is there somebody actually insisting that homework get done? All these things are really important. And so to me, it's a call for community, call for community. If we know that these are really pressing demands, I believe we, were, we, we would res respond and commit ourselves either to getting involved personally or supporting those who are able and willing to get involved personally. But we need to start with making that call out there. And I'm not sure we're doing enough of that. All right. Uh, so we have some questions that get back to the, the earlier topic that we had about the, the functioning of the courts during this time. Um, and, and one of those is in an adversarial system, um, how can, with a virtual or video system, do you deal with the subtle clues that may be provided by body language that can be extremely valuable to the attorneys, jurors, and judges? So very good question. And, and so in, in our earlier conversation, we talked about those things that we have come to expect in a court process and those things which we think are really required as a matter of constitutional law. And that's where we start wrestling with those, those kinds of questions. So for example, uh, if you ever sat on the witness stand and have been cross-examined, uh, an attorney, a good one, who knows how to cross-examine a witness has this ability to give you this awful look and bore into the witness. Obviously the ability to do that virtually would be compromised. Does that mean the inability to do that or a compromised ability to do that falls below the legal standard of what is required for effective confrontation, or is that just something you lose because you just don't have it anymore? Uh, clearly, if we have our way, we would prefer to not lose anything by going virtual. The reality is we're going to lose some things. And, you know, we definitely are trying to make sure that you can read the body language of a witness. And we even have this question when they come into court. If they're wearing a mask, for example, uh, do they take off the mask? Do we give them a face shield so we can still see their facial feature features? Uh, we're more talking about um, more talking about if you do a jury trial virtually, your jury selection process, especially being able to do that by by remote technology, less so the examination of witnesses. But even there, how do you uh, examine the credibility of of your potential jurors? And, and the suitability of potential jurors. So those are real questions. Uh, we also have questions about making sure that uh, the, the rules of sequestration and secrecy are, are being upheld. So for example, you, you, you tell a jury not to interact with people and talk about the case. Well, how do we know that there's not somebody in the room right next door uh, that they're gonna talk to as soon as the, the cases, the, the proceedings are over? Uh, even the witness, if a witness is being uh, providing their testimony by, by remote technology, how do we know they're not being coached? Some of that's being, uh, will, will be dealt with by admonition. Some of these are, are risks that we just don't have a way of protecting against, that we'd almost have to assume in, in the, as, a, as a part of the process. So these are all very good questions. Uh, there are other states that are moving forward in these areas, and I think what's happening is the answer will be that you utilize these formats where you can and you don't use it for every type of scenario. So for, you, for example, you wouldn't use it in a, in a very serious felony case or a very serious murder case, but maybe in a shoplifting case, you, the attorneys might agree and the parties might agree that given all the shortcomings, this is a way to get the case moving and get the backlog thinned out. So there are definitely compromises in the process. 
and and referring to to backlogs you know we, we've 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 heard about issues with case loads at, at the federal judiciary certainly um you know how how has georgia's judicial system managed uh its its case load in in, in the past and then how how is how do you think that's going to work going forward well you know we are all over the place as a state in terms of of where judges are and their ability to, to move their cases. I think by and large, they've done a good job. But where we are pretty uniform is the backlog that's at all trial court levels. And we, I should mention, we have several different classes of court in Georgia that have court proceedings. We have municipal courts for your cities, your magistrate courts for your counties, your probate courts, state courts, juvenile courts, superior courts. We have a new business court and then the court of appeals and the Supreme Court. And all the, all the trial courts will be uniformly under a huge burden of a backlog that they will have to dig out, out from dealing with criminal cases first and then those non-criminal cases that still deal with life and safety. For example, uh, temporary protection orders aren't criminal, but they're necessary to protect the safety of somebody who feels threatened by somebody who won't leave them alone. We have a question about uh, the bar exam. Why is it necessary to have an in-person bar exam in Georgia? And is there any possibility, as is now done in some states, to waive the bar exam for graduates of Georgia law schools? I don't see us waiving the bar exam. The reason why we don't want to waive the bar exam is because the bar exam is one additional very important uh, safeguard mechanisms that we have to before we unleash lawyers on the general public. We, we take the ability to practice law and to represent to the public that you are suitable to practice law very seriously. And I don't even think the law schools will tell you that they believe that the law school experience itself is enough to guarantee suitability to, to practice law. So that is one critical step that we still need. Whether it needs to be in person or not, we've, we've, we've played around with that. I shouldn't say played around, but we've looked into that. And the decision, at least for now, is that we're gonna do it online. Uh, we've made some adjustments to the format of the exam to accommodate that experience. One of the reasons why we like to do it uh, in person is because we have a better ability to proctor the exam process. But uh, in this scenario, we're, we, we have to give up on something and we think we have some ways to maintain the integrity of the testing process. Uh, but it is not as critical that it be in person, but it is still very critical in our view that it, it be done. Uh, we have a, a couple, uh, well, a, a, a compliment and then a question related to uh, uh, real estate generally, I guess I'll say. We have a, a thank you from one of our members of our audience for the early work on virtual real estate closings. Uh, they said that was a timely and huge help. Um, and, and then we have a question, how can the court balance the reality of the pandemic on eviction proceedings? ensuring due process for tenants while protecting landlords who have their own obligations, um, but currently must continue to provide, can, currently must continue to provide housing to tenants who either are not paying rent or otherwise in violation of a lease. Yeah, so just by way of context, what happened on the front end of the pandemic when we went to uh, core essential functions by the courts, and let me point out, I will, I'm proud of the courts that we did not close. Courts did not close. We, we kept open, we kept ourselves open. We felt like we had a constitutional, legal, moral obligation to remain open. But we did go down, trim down to bear and core essential functions. In the magistrate courts, which handled a lot of the eviction proceedings, uh, they put a hold on uh, eviction proceedings uh, while they dealt with other more life-threatening types of issues. They slowly began to build that, that back up and, and they now have the capacity to move forward on eviction proceedings. In the midst of that, that imposed a huge burden on many landlords who, who need money 
to pay the bills associated with the building itself. So the landlords were falling behind on their obligations, either to the bank or other financial obligations they may have had. So it created a hardship on, on that end. I don't know if that struck the right balance, but that was the balance that was, was ne that, that necessarily followed. Uh, right now, the courts are, they have the ability, there's no, there's no prohibition on moving forward on any of these types of proceedings. The, the practical reality is they're trying to get to it when they can and balancing all the other items that happen to be before that particular judge at that particular moment. I should say this, um, and, th and this is a big picture concept, concept that, that's, that you should be aware of when you think of the pandemic as it relates to the judiciary. than a movie theater, uh, a bowling alley, a football game, in that we require parties to show up. So when we say we're open for business, we're gonna hear this case or that case. We order people to leave their living rooms, get up off their couch, get in a car and come to our building. And if they don't, there are legal consequences either to their case or their own freedom if they fail to do that. When we have a jury trial, we order people to get up off their couch, come and serve on a jury and their legal implications. So if we have that power and we exercise that power, we have a moral obligation to make sure that we can do so in a safe fashion. So for that reason, we have been probably overly, not overly cautious, but we've been extra cautious in, in insisting on presence before, before requiring people to be in our, our building. That I, re I recognize has caused hardship uh, and we're eager to, to, to move forward on all other aspects, the grand jury proceedings and the jury trial proceedings as soon as we can. But you should know that that's been the lens that which, through which we've looked at these types of issues. Right, we, have a, we have a question here that, um, that the state has moved toward cross state licensing, especially on the healthcare front as the coronavirus took over. Um, is this expected to create additional litigation in Georgia? And maybe we'll broaden it out. Uh, do, you, do you foresee a change in um, or, or an increase in litigation coming out of the pandemic as people are challenging, you know, either what their governments, uh, local or state governments imposed or, 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 or other ways that maybe they feel like their rights were, were not upheld? We, we know in, in anything that you do on a mass scale, um, there's going to be challenges some of those challenges are just because not you, you create something that you're doing new for the first time and maybe you did it right, maybe you didn't do it right. Maybe you did it right, but people don't know. And you don't have a choice but to test these things out in court. So absolutely, we'll get, we'll get litigation about, about what has happened. Um, we'll probably on the front end of the, those types of cases coming in. Uh, a lot of the new mechanisms that we have in place that and courts will put in place, they'll do it because they think it's right. Uh, but until a court says, oh yeah, that's absolutely right, you don't know. So all those things will be tested before too long. Uh, and uh, we have one here. We often read about the divisiveness of the federal Supreme Court with five, four decisions. Uh, that, that's not really the, that's not been what we've seen in, in Georgia Supreme Court. So. Is there, as Chief Justice, is there a, any specific approach you try to take along with your colleagues uh, to ensure the right outcome for Georgians that, that somehow manages to avoid these, uh, these very narrowly split decisions? Well, uh, I will tell you there is unanimity, uh, both in terms of the operational aspect of how we run the courts and on the Supreme Court itself. Uh, we value the relationships that we have with one another first and foremost. We are friends, we care about one another, we eat lunch as often as we can, at least we used to, and we disagree, we don't take it personal, we shake hands, we, we go out to eat afterwards, and we value that. And as long as we value that and hear from each other, um, we can have a very effective, healthy process to issuing our decisions. And you're right, most of our decisions are unanimous, 9-0. It's not a result of anything I do. We let everybody talk. We often have the mindset um, 
that that we're trying to get it right. When we issue an opinion, the it's like a group writing exercise. It's nine justices writing one opinion. It may, may have my name uh, on it, but I'm going to get comments from at least three or four justices on every opinion that I write. And an opinion, the, the comments can be anything from this whole division doesn't sound right to me to we need to call it a mobile home instead of a trailer because to the person that lives there, it's a home. It could be any of those types of things. And, and we try to accommodate every single request that comes in from a fellow justice. Very, very accommodating. On the pandemic side, I'll have to tell you this, all those classes of court that I mentioned, each one of those classes of court has a leadership council, president, vice president, incoming, all those kinds of things. We tie all those councils together with a overarching judicial council. I serve as chief. I don't have control over any of those folks. I can't make anybody do anything. So as chief, my main job is to say, please, a lot. And so what we do when we have our judicial council meetings, we hear from everybody. It's, a, it's, it's not a fast moving ship because we, everybody has their say. We throw out our ideas, we, we, we ask for input. They're not shy, they give us input. But we've built up this relationship over time to where they trust that they can say something and we're gonna hear them. We don't always agree, but we always hear. And I'm really, really pleased that our, the leadership of our, our courts all throughout the state, all classes of court have been so collaborative, so cooperative, very much on the problem solving mode we could be intimidated very easily by the scope of the questions that we're trying to address. And we have those moments, but then we push through and say, well, here, how about this? And we massage that, play with it. We throw some out, we keep some, and we move the ball forward. So I, I, I believe you're exactly right. And I'm proud of our courts for, 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 for those characteristics that you just identified. All right, and we have, we have uh, two, uh, two last questions. Is there a little bit more of a personal note. So um, uh, the first one is what motivates you every day as you consider the difficult cases uh, before you? Gosh, what my, yeah. So I, first of all, I'm, I'm a public servant junkie. I've worked for the state for 30 years. I did 11 years with the attorney general's office, two and a half years with Governor Purdue and on this court now for 15 years. So I, I realized early on in my college days, I like doing government work. I, I like having my hands on what is going on around me. I feel detached when I have to rely on everybody else who I don't know to do these things on my behalf. I love being the person that makes the decision as opposed to being a lawyer arguing on, on behalf of a client for a court to make a decision. Uh, I love the administrative side. Uh, it, it has its burden because there's a weight of responsibility that comes with that. But when it's over and I look back, I look back and I think that was really good. That was fun. I was glad to be able to play a role in shaping how, how the outcome of this came about. There is a weight of responsibility that is heavy and you, you want to get it right. You realize that everything you do impacts lives. I realize that there are people sitting in jail. There, there are people who have real critical questions that need to be addressed right now that aren't getting the answers they need. That's, that's a heavy burden. Uh, I gain perspective by looking at history. Uh, I'm not comparing myself by any stretch of the imagination to Lincoln, but I look at the burden that somebody like Abraham Lincoln had to live under all day, every day during the Civil War where the country literally was falling apart and People who he knew and loved were dying around him and his friends, families and, and, and friends were dying. How do you hold up under that? There's a lot of strength and endurance that, that you have to call upon to make that happen. Same thing with Winston Churchill, anybody that led under extreme times. So those are inspirations to me, even though I'm looking at something that's, that's very, very serious, but on, on a lighter scale, uh, they, they serve as a source of um, challenge and perspective, I guess, and that challenge and perspective is very helpful. And then the idea that, like, you, like we talked about before, the collaboration that we have, the, the feeling that I'm not in this alone, that we 
have good people who are standing side by side trying to, to make sure we get this right is, is a real source of strength as well. Great. And then the, the final one that we have here is what have you learned about yourself during the, during the pandemic? Oh, goodness. So I hate to admit this. I, I'm, I'm more and more convinced during my time as chief that I am simply not an idea guy. I do not have the good ideas. I do have the sense enough, though, to li listen to people around me. And thankfully, we have good idea people. And once we get a, a path going, uh, I can I can move something from A to B and bring people together who can move place, uh, projects from A to B. That's a skill set that I can offer. So I've learned more about my weaknesses and my strengths. I think other people have learned more about my weaknesses and strengths and what their strengths are. And so we've been able to fill those gaps and, and, and move forward. Um, and that's been very encouraging to be a little bit more self-aware uh, uh, and hopefully that will, that will aid me in the future and, and, and aid others as I know better about how to, to be effective going forward. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chief Justice Melton, for, for being with us this morning, uh, for sharing those insights and, and the wisdom that you've learned. Um, uh, in a constitutional order like ours, it's good and necessary to think about, you know, what remains constant as even as circumstances change. And, and so we help you, we appreciate you um, helping us think through, think through that. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be able to be, be, be with you all. Thank you. Um, before we conclude, I'd like to thank our sponsors one more time, our presenting sponsor, AT&T, our platinum sponsors, Verizon and the Walton Family Foundation, and our silver sponsor, the Georgia Association of Realtors. Uh, and, and with that, our series has come to an end. Uh, we at the Georgia Public Policy Foundation believe in the power of Georgians to adapt to a changing world. Uh, we believe that by improving public policy, we can improve the lives of all Georgians. And so we thank each one of you who have joined us during this series uh, for your interest in making our state a better place in this way. And we look forward to continuing the conversation uh, in person once we have the opportunity. But until we meet again, thank you very much and we are adjourned. <laughs>